This is Public Resource. The Internet Code Improvement Commission. We are speaking with uh, Fred Dingledy, who is a senior research librarian at William and Mary Law School, and we're going to be talking about codes today. I thought maybe we can start with the field code in New York. Welcome, Fred. What's the field code? Did it work? I love the field code. That is a that is a very good place to start. Did it work? Well, short answer ish, um, but the longer answer. Um, the, the field code that was uh, that was created uh, uh, about the middle of the 19th century. There had been efforts to to codify it, to codify the law for quite some time, and one of the best places to start was procedural law in New York State. He wanted to uh, codify the law, and he saw that probably procedural law might be one of the best places because the law was getting very hard to find. Like legislatures and the courts kept cranking out law by the middle of the 19th century. There was a lot of law. It was often hard to find out what the law was. You know, outdated laws, laws that have been superseded, sat next to uh, up-to-date laws. So sometimes lawyer had to like do a lot of research between different session laws, cases, and what have you, just to see you know, what is the state of the law today. Even by those standards, though, procedural law in New York courts was horrible. There was a lot of leftover procedures from like the old English court days. So you know, very particular um, pleadings, practice, that sort of thing. Why don't we codify the law? Why don't we, re- you know, clean up the law, rearrange it, make it easy for people to understand? So he was able to finally, you know, even that took a lot of persuading because the establishment, they didn't like the idea of codification. They liked the common law because, you know, it's what they're used to. But they finally agreed, okay, procedure law in New York, it's a mess. So they allowed Field to create his code of civil procedure in the courts. And it did a lot of good things. It really did clean up procedural law. It made more sense. It was easier to understand a lot of the old bizarre pleadings that are left over from centuries ago in old English court procedure. They were gone. They were replaced by something more logical. That said, the code did have some flaws and the courts were still conservative. They still fought the field code. So whatever they could resist it, whenever they could just try to ignore the code, whenever they could just try to you know, implement it very poorly and say, well, I guess the code's just not very good. Um, So they kind of persisted the code. And eventually, after a couple of decades, the flaws in the field code, um, there are some bits of inconsistencies, some bits of law that still didn't work very well. Uh, The the state assembly eventually gave up. And I think it was 1870. They repealed the field code. They said, "Okay, we gave it a shot. We tried. But it was the first attempt to create a code of some portion of a state's law. And it was successful for a little bit. They actually able to, were able to get the assembly to agree to it. It was an attempt to reform the law through a code. And Field also created a lot of substantive law codes, so criminal codes, civil codes, that sort of thing. New York never passed them, but some of the Western states did. Because Western states didn't have this big, long establishment history of using the common law, all these laws that we've learned how to use. They liked these Field substantive codes. So Field's work actually did somewhat succeed in the Western states. He was codifying the common law or was he codifying the statutes that were passed by the legislatures? Uh, For the most part, with the field code, this was more just court procedures. So probably more common law, probably more common law than than actual legislation passed by the legislature. Today, we think of codification as basically you're taking all the session laws that a legislature passes and you're codifying them. You're putting them all in the same place. You're annotating them to say, here's the history or this one was ruled unconstitutional by a Supreme Court. Does anyone codify the common law? Do people actually take the time to go through all the court decisions and come up with a penal code, if you will? Or do the judges still kind of own the common law? The judges still own the common law. I mean, the United States, we've pretty much given up on any attempt to codify the common law. Way back in the beginning, when the United States was first a brand new country, even then, the people, the the, newly independent colonists, they were hesitant to let go of the common law because they knew what rights they had under the common law. They were worried if it codified, well, maybe we're giving up some of those rights. But then slowly, decade after decade of new independence, late 18th century, early 19th century, law started getting more and more complicated. Courts kept producing more and more laws. The legislature started producing more and more laws. Laws were getting complicated. A populist movement started to rise uh, arise, you know, around the time of the Jackson presidency. And one of their arguments against the common law was that back then, judges were almost always appointed by, uh, by the government. So they said, we have this elite priesthood of uh, judges who are interpreting the law. This is a very anti-populist thing. We think codification might be a good way to... Um, uh, 
change this because a code would be enacted by a legislature, popularly elected. So there's movement for that. The Code Napoleon had come out of France. So Americans were looking at that saying, well, France has done this. They France pretty much took their old traditional laws and they totally revamped them, compiled them, enacted them as a code. That's a great idea. Louisiana was doing its uh, doing codification. So some of the other American states were looking at Louisiana saying, well, Louisiana can do it. Why can't we? So it was the start of a movement in the early 19th century towards maybe we should codify everything, not just the statutes, the common law. The problem was the support for codifying everything was inconsistent, but there was always a steady opposition to codifying the common law. The establishment was arguing common law is more flexible than a code. Code will never have the flexibility this new country needs to adapt to new situations. But of course, what was left unsaid was the establishment liked the common law. They knew the common law, and they didn't want to have to relearn a system that had already worked for them pretty well. So there's always a steady opposition, but the support for the codifying the common law just kind of peeled off as the century progressed. Uh, the populists, uh, they got popular elections of the judges. That kept them happy. They said, OK, we have popularly elected judges. That's fine. We don't have this elite, pre elite priesthood anymore. Lawyers who, in the beginning of the 19th century, had trouble finding out what the law was because, again, legislatures kept producing laws, of course, kept producing cases, and there was no one source that you could look at to say, here's what's enforced, here's what's not enforced. So you're going to all these different session law books, all these different cases. Um, but then in the middle of the 19th century, you started to get more treatises that focused on American law. Before that, most of the treatises published in the U.S. were just like English law treatises that maybe had an appendix that said, oh, and here's some of the American law of this sovereign as well. Middle of the 19th century, you start to see treatises that focus on American law were designed for American law. You have the case digest starting to come out. You have indexes of law. And all of this uh, means that lawyers now have an easier way to find the law. So now they're saying, well, we don't really need a code to find the law because we now have this digest points to developing cases. So support just kind of waned. And usually by the time the Civil War rolled around, support for total codification is pretty much dead. Uh, they had reached a compromise by that point, the anti-codifiers and the codifiers, uh, partial codification, codifying the statutes. The establishment said, OK, if we codify the statutes, maybe that will keep the codification advocates happy. Codification advocates just saw this as the first step to total codification. But of course, they were wrong because that's as far as it ever went. That's what we kind of end up with in the United States. We codified the statutes. Common law, though, it remains the common law. You know, and if you want to know, you know, if you want a guide to what the common law says, you've got your indexes, your digests, your treatises. And that's just kind of the compromise that the United States ended up with. That's sort of how we ended up where we are today. What were the early states that were codifying their statutes? Were the, the, the things that we now know as codified legislation? Wisconsin, was that one of them? Or uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin kind of came into the end of the, in the 20, like early 20th century. Um, that'll get interesting. I'll get to that in a little bit. But one of the first ones, like California, they were one of the first ones to codify, but it was a long struggle California had. And it kind of illustrates the problem that you went into with codification. It kind of gets into our work about um, how today a lot of the books we look at as codes are really compilations. They're not the actual binding law. Because um, California, they originally enacted a code when they first uh, gained statehood. But it took them like half a century before they could like update the code. And this is a problem a lot of states ran into with uh, codes. Um, Virginia, which uh, passed codes a couple uh, a couple times, even like the early 19th century, Virginia and North Carolina were some of the states that would pass codes, but there'd be like a couple of decades between each code because those early codes, they wanted the legislature to enact the new code so that, you know, you looked at the code, you know, this is the binding law, what we call positive law. You know that if you look at the code, this we know this is what the law is. Someone can't point to another book and say, well, the session law that the legislature passed two years ago says this. He said, well, this is positive law. It's positive law. That's what we want. Um, so uh, California was doing this. Virginia and North Carolina were even doing this early part of the 19th century. The problem was you had to get the legislature to actually pass this codified law. And so Virginia and North Carolina, they only managed to enact codes maybe couple of times, I think like five, six times over the course of the 20th century, because usually they would uh, create this uh, code commission to like, you know, look at all the laws, say, here's how we organize law, here's what's in effect. Then they have to run about that final code, you know, this compilation of the entire body of the law. Legislature actually has to look at it and pass it. In California ran into the same problem. They were able to enact one code, like in 1850s, and then a couple of decades later, they passed another one. And like decades would pass, and then committees would try to form, they would try to create um, a code, but then their um, limited uh, time of appointment would expire and they say, 
sorry, we can't come on an agreement. And even if the committee comes up with like a code, um, legislature still has to pass it. A lot of times the bill would just kind of die in assembly because the legislature just did not get around to looking at this big giant code and enacting it into law. Finally, like in California, around the uh, early 20th century, the committee actually had to set up special evening sessions just to look at this revised code so that the legislature would actually pass it. So you had states like California, you had um, Virginia, you had North Carolina, you had, I uh, think, South, no, North Dakota was one of the early uh, states to uh, codify. Um, Missouri has an interesting provision in its constitution that says that they will revise the statutes every 10 years. That's more of a compilation than a codification. But they were trying to like compile their statutes as early as like the 1870s, um, which is where Wisconsin comes into play. About 1900, Wisconsin comes up with the idea of having a reviser of statutes. Instead of like occasionally appointing this code commission to you know revise the code, they would create this office of the reviser of the statutes. And some of the most important powers that this reviser had was the, the reviser could pass a reviser's bill. They could look at one part of the code, one title of the code, and say, okay, here's how I think you should revise this. The legislature could pass that particular title. That would be a positive law enactment, you know, at least until they started changing it again. Probably the most important thing, the most important innovation, every at the end of every session, the reviser would look at the laws that had been passed by the legislature. And the reviser would integrate that into the code and publish a new code for that session. So at the end of every session of the Wisconsin legislature, there'd be a new volume of Wisconsin statutes um, created by the reviser of statutes. It would go out to the lawyers. It was much cheaper than you know, trying to compile, you know, trying to like take your 20-year-old code and getting every single session law volume since then, piecing things together. End of every session, you had this nice, relatively affordable publication, up to date. Lawyers loved it. The state loved that the lawyers had ready access to what the law looked like today. Of course, the thing is, legislature never passed this, you know, Wisconsin statutes, the reviser of statutes published. So it's not actually the law. It's just a compilation. I mean, the reviser of statutes, presumably they do a very good job. So it's strong evidence of the law, but some can still point to like the original session law from 20 years ago, say, well, the session law, here's the wording that's different from the code. So you would have to go to the session laws text. So on the plus side, you got this new code. It's kept up to date, it's more affordable, but now we're getting to where we are today where a lot of the things that are called codes, they're not the actual binding positive law. They're just prima facie evidence of the law. It's dead. That's better than nothing, right? It's, it's no different with acts of Congress in which the U.S. code is presumed to be the law. In fact, it's enacted as positive law on occasion. But if there's a disagreement, one can go back to the actual statutes at large. One can consult for legislative intent, you know, the reports, the hearings that led to that law, and convince the judge that when it says X, they actually know Y. That's not that different from what we think of today. Um, do all the states codify their laws? I mean, in the sense of like compiling the laws together, I think every state will have a code of some sort. So that is one of those things like whatever state you go to now, there is a code. Um, now, of course, who arranges the code that varies from state to state. Usually there will be at least a state a agency that is in charge, that is theoretically ultimately in charge of saying, you know, this is what the code should look like. A lot of states will call for help from private publishers like, you know, either Thompson Reuters or uh, Matthew Bender, LexisNexis, that sort of thing. They will get help from those publishers in arranging the statutes, adding editorial notes. At least whatever state you go to, there will be some sort of a compilation of the laws, even if it's not like official positive law code. They get that help for free, right? The, the Lexus doesn't charge them. Lexus simply gets the exclusive right to sell the code. Isn't that the typical arrangement? That is a very good question. And I would have to look at some of those uh, contracts. I'm not sure what the exact terms of those, of those deals would be. What would be? I looked at the contracts and that was a leading question. Yes, uh, the typical deal is that, in fact, and, and that's the justification for uh, allowing an expensive price to sell the code by the vendor. The typical deal in this would cost you millions of dollars to do it yourself, according to, to the people that make these deals. But we know how to do this. That's what Lexus says. Let us take care of this for you. Typically, 
if you look at the contracts, the state gets to buy copies and discount for itself or maybe get some copies for free, like in every county law library. I think Georgia does that. But that's pretty much it. The actual right to sell the code on whatever price and format and terms of use that the vendor decides is pretty typically left totally up to them. Uh, we did Wisconsin and New York. Why do we have codes? Are they there for judges? Are they there for lawyers? Are they there to educate the populace? That is a very good question. I mean, the idea is that a code is supposed to make it easy for anyone, whether you're a judge, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're, I mean, directly a member of the public, the idea is that anyone should be able to know what the law is, even going all the way back to like, you know, Justinian and the Byzantine Empire and some of the early, uh, uh, governments from over the years, the idea behind a code was that your citizens should be able to know what the law is, and a code makes that easier. Code code takes the laws that the rule maker has given, that the lawgiver has given, and then it arranges them in an easy format that someone can look at and say, okay, I need to know what the laws are on this subject. I can look that up. And again, in theory, that's what the code is supposed to let you do, is give you one-stop shopping, let you know what the st- what the law is like today. So theoretically, it's the code is for everybody. Um, but, you know, judges will, I mean, if you look at court opinions, judges will almost always cite to the code now. You look at the blue book, they're always encouraged to cite to the code instead of the session laws, if at all possible. It's sort of become the default way for people to look at the law. I see, I see. paper from steel to silicon, publication of statutes, public access to the law. Um, You quote Lon Fuller in his classic book, The Morality of Law. You say in there that there's eight ways that the law can go awry, and two of them have to do with promulgation, the failure to publicize the laws, and even worse, a failure to make the laws understandable. Why is that? Why, why do people need to know the law? You just hire a lawyer. Like, they take care of that for you, right? It's a naive thing. I've heard people say that. I mean, and unfortunately, a lot of times that to know the law, you have to hire a lawyer these days, but that's not how the law is supposed to work. The law is supposed to be... Law is supposed to be something where you know what you're supposed to do. I mean, if... I know ignorance of the law is no excuse, as the as the old saying goes. But you have to give people, you have to work with people to a certain amount. For a person to follow the law, you have to have a reasonable expectation that they know what the law is. And if you're making the law so complicated or just plain impossible to um, understand, you can't be surprised when they're not following the law. And if you're making the law difficult to understand, that can be like a symptom of a larger problem. Like in, in the steel to the steel to silicon article, I mentioned like Caligula, he was pretty much told you, if you want to pass a new tax, you have to publicize the tax law. And he said, okay, fine. So he published it way, way up on this wall in one of the public forums says, okay, there you go, published. And that's kind of a symptom saying, you know, if the, the government is making it so difficult to understand what the law is, then the, your citizens are going to at some point start wondering, well, why don't you want us to know what the law is? What else are you wondering? And it's going to, a citizen's going to start losing faith in their government if they're making it hard to understand what the law is. Never mind, you know, expecting that citizen to actually follow the law because how can you know what, how can you follow the law when you don't know what the law is? So that's, that's why promulgation, that's why promulgation and publication are so important. Yeah, because you need to know what the law is to follow it. I would say in today's modern age that everybody needs to know the law. If you're a teacher, you need to understand the laws relating to schools and equal access. And if you're a realtor, you need to understand zoning laws and discrimination. If you're an industry executive, you should probably have some knowledge of antitrust, even if what you're trying to do is subvert the antitrust laws. But you should at least know what they are. Yeah. Exactly. And, and yeah, and to just say, well, hire a lawyer. I mean, now we're getting back to the old populist argument, you know, you know, do we have, do we just like, you know, rely on this elite group of people to determine what the law is and what the law isn't? Whereas in theory, at least people are supposed to be able to know that. 
the principle, again, um, in your paper, you quote John Locke and uh, Jeremy Bentham as basically trying to explain why English law had to be promulgated better. Wasn't that one of the big issues that the colonies had is that they didn't know what the hell the laws were that London was passing? I mean, that was one of the problems. I mean, part of it was like they didn't really have much say in what the, in what the laws were. But again, that's like, yeah, by the time, you know, the word gets over from England, here's what the law is and you know, or what what is the law. And, of course, I was like, in America, you know, you didn't have this legal publication system that, you know, England probably had started had at this time. In Virginia, for the longest time, printing presses were... I forget if they were strictly forbidden or just like very, very tightly controlled by the colonial and then the state government. So, you know, you were relying on manuscript, basically handwritten versions of the law. So it was very difficult to get any sort of publication as, you know, what the law was. You're kind of like, you know, relying on, you know, fingers crossed you knew someone who uh, could get the books shipped over from England, which again, you know, takes time. It's probably pretty expensive. So, you know, unless you were fairly well off uh, or maybe, you know, but you're a government library that maybe had one copy. Yeah, it was hard to know what the law was because there was just not a publication system in place for you to really find that out easily. And you were just, again, relying on other people who did know. So yeah, that, that, was, that was one of the problems. Didn't Thomas Jefferson try to change that? Tried. <laughs> um, eventually, you know, eventually, they were allowed, eventually the printing presses were allowed in Virginia and they were starting to publish, like, you know, printed books, but it took a long time. There was a long time when you were just relying on manuscript versions of law, which was one of the problems Virginia ran into early on when they were trying to um, come up with compilations of early statutes. It's like they were just relying on these sort of scattershot copies of the manuscript laws, and some of them had just kind of disappeared over the years because, you know, maybe the old courts held on to the manuscript laws. Sometimes they would just toss them if they decided they weren't necessary anymore. So it was hard to know, like, some of those laws, they just could not find copies of them. And, you know, when you're dealing with hand copies, got the old problem is people make mistakes. No matter how diligent the copier is, you know, mistakes get worked into copies. So Jefferson set out to change that. Wasn't he the one that advocated the compilation of the statutes published in a reasonably priced book that would be available to all the frontier lawyers? He did. He And he liked the idea. He was talking about how it was necessary for lots of people to have copies of the books. Uh, and he you think he even like expressed a fear of what would happen if we relied on a central collection of all the laws. Unfortunately, Jefferson would end up being very prescient on that count because um, a lot of the Virginia records, court records, other sorts of records were kept in the Richmond for safekeeping during the Civil War. And uh, at the end of the Civil War, uh, fleeing Confederate soldiers set fire to uh, part of Richmond, basically trying, you know, they didn't want the Union forces that were approaching to get Richmond, so they set a fire. They were not very good at controlled burns, though, and pretty much ended up burning most of Richmond down, including all pretty much all the records that have been kept for safekeeping in Richmond. So a lot of those pre-Civil War records in Richmond, in Virginia, went up in smoke. So Jefferson had a very good idea. It's like, we cannot rely on a central collection. We need to have affordable printed books that lawyers across the country, whether you're a big city or, you know, rural lawyer, they need to have access to those laws. That was an important point. Well, there you go. Promulgation is not a new idea. Fred Dingledye, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time and talking with me today. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you. Our work at Public Resource is made possible by a generous grant from Arcadia. Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin.